You are listening to Rouge Radio, a proud member of the Canadian Football Podcast Network. It's time to get the point as Rouge Radio is ready to kick off. Ready! The best football talk with the best in the business. So what is the cost? You have two first-round picks this year because the Argos are dumb enough to trade for Drew Willie. A few rookies. We go directly to the on-field product. We welcome to the show the 20th overall pick in this past Sunday's CFL draft, DeAndre Wright of the Alouettes. DeAndre, welcome to the show. Thank you, guys. Thank you for having me. And the occasional Hall of Famer. Please welcome Doug Brown, who is one of the members of the current class of 2016 in the CFL Hall of Fame. Doug, thanks for joining us today. Oh, thank you, guys, for the kind words and for me on the program. Rouge Radio is on the air. Here's your hosts, Robert Dalton and Tony Allen. And we are back. We are in week three of nine of our nine teams in nine weeks. And then this week we focus on the most Western team of the Canadian Football League, the British Columbia Lions. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Robert Dalton and joining me as always, Mr. Tony Allen. This is episode 432 the Rouge Radio Podcast, powered by the Canadian Football Podcast Network. And no, we will not be doing any Seinfeld impressions this week. So if anybody is eager to, to listen to Seinfeld quotes, it's not going to happen. At least not, we're not planning on it. Tony, how's that? How, you still out in Lethbridge? Yes, I am. I am on day, oh, what, 15 of 21. I'm on 21 straight days of work. No days off. I'm on day 15 All before right. I get a holiday. So I am exhausted. Oh, jeez. Uh, that, 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 that day off can't come soon enough. That was, oh, it was, I know. So when's the next day off? Uh, May 6th. Okay. Whatever. Yeah, something like that. I think right on Mother's Day. So <laughs> I get to go home and then be like, how come you didn't get me a Mother's Day present? <laughs> So well, it'll be fun. I'm your Mother's Day present. Is what Actually, the next line should be. I am. I I am here to tell all the young men out there, or older men, I guess. When you get married, plan ahead. Maybe the younger guys. Then, when I planned my wedding with my wife, obviously, when I say planned, I mean agreed to everything in our <laughs> marriage about our wedding day. Check the days around the calendar. See what else is coming up. Because I agreed to get married on May 5th. And you know what happens like three days after May 5th? Mother's Day. And you know what you're not thinking about when you're just brandly newly married in your 20s? That eventually Mother's Day could be an option for you. So that you end up with an anniversary and Mother's Day within days of each other. So uh, there's a little pro tip for any of you young guys. If you're thinking about proposing and end up getting married a year from when you propose, check the dates, <laughs> Just pick up a calendar and look around, make sure you're not doubling up on anything. So there you go. There's my uh, hashtag <laughs> married life uh, uh, advice for you. Our, our anniversary is May 15th. So I hear you. I hear you. Yeah, you didn't do uh, much better. <laughs> Outside of that, uh, how's, how's life? I've, I've got a bone to pick with you, by the way. And, Why and, would I do? All right. So if you're... Or get in line. Yeah. Get in line. <laughs> First in line is, is Tony's wife, who is upset yeah. that you appear. Now, you know, we've we, we had this talk about a couple of weeks ago about us having this little side CFL podcast where we're, we're fishing. Mm-hmm. You're, you're expecting me to spend 25 bucks on this real fish VR? What's up with that? Oh, trust me. It is worth every penny. <laughs> It is every penny's worth of that fishing game. Although all the Oculus games are expensive, that one is worth every penny. And if anyone has ever played that, if you're listening and you played real VR fishing, tell the adults it's totally worth the twenty five dollars. Yeah. Okay. I'll uh, I'll I'll take your word on it. It'll, I'll I'll have to start I'll have to start a Kickstarter. Yeah. Uh, we've got a great show uh, lined up here. Of course, we're continuing our nine teams in nine weeks. And this week, obviously, the BC Lions. As we'll uh, we'll have uh, our full interview uh, as I, I talk to the play-by-play guy Bob uh, Marjanovic, uh, the Moj, as everybody affectionately knows him. Uh, we'll sh- uh, we'll show that interview uh, later on. Uh, the CFL came out with some new rules. Uh, it, I don't I don't know if you're, if there's a rule oh, yeah. that came out. Is there anything the the rule that came out uh, that that maybe got you scratching your head? Refresh my memory on the rule changes. 
Oh. Do you have them handy? You know what? I just I was not ready for it, and I should have, <laughs> because like I said, I've been working nonstop all day. But if you happen to know what the rule changes are off the top of your head, I'd appreciate it, because oh. <laughs> I did not come into this prepared enough. I was mostly just here to bash the BC Lions for 45 minutes, but... <laughs> All right, so uh, one of the major rules uh, that came out is the hash marks in the CFL field will be moved closer to center field. Each one will be 28 yards from the near sideline instead of 24. Now, this is to maybe take away the wide side receiver from being a decoy and get him more involved and therefore, uh, you know, maybe becoming, you know, you know, like I said, more involved in the offense and maybe pipe up the, the, the scoring in the CFL, which went down dramatically last year. Uh, your thoughts on that one to begin with? Uh, so the receiver or the quarterbacks are going to have less distance to throw to the hash marks. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I mean so then that... we don't have to watch that wonderful play where he turns or pivots and throws out and then the ball falls like three yards in front of the eligible receiver's feet because that play never works. Yeah. <laughs> Rarely ever works. And, and That would be good. I'm fine with that then. If I don't have to see another football fall short of that guy that's gone wide out from the hash marks, uh, then I I'm all for it. You know who's going to help? This is going to help uh, Ali Murtada, the field goal kicker for there Winnipeg, because those hash marks are going to be lined up with the uh, with the goalposts almost. And uh, yeah, so you know he had some uh, sinking issues last year where he lined up on the left, he missed it wide left, he lined up on the right and missed wide right. Now that the hash marks are a little bit closer, we we might have Ali Murtada, most improved player, going into the uh, 2022 season. There we you, go. You you heard it here first. That's my prediction. Uh, offenses will get more of a head start after a made field goal or single point drives will start from the 40 yard line instead of the 35 line. I I, mm. I think that is you know okay so it's a it's kind of like a kick in the butt for offenses but I don't know if the start I think this is a moot point. I don't think uh, th this is a new rule that I don't think a lot of people are really going to care or talk about going into. Uh, five yards is five yards. I mean, you probably are good tossed into field goal range. You know, if you can't make that from from starting from the 35, you're likely not going to make it from the 40 yard line. So, uh, any thoughts on that before we move on? No, very little on that one. All right, very little thoughts. There we go. Okay, so the biggest one that a lot of people had uh, had scratched their head is there are. All no yards penalties, which are assigned when the cover team invades the five yard hail around the returner as he fields a punt, will be 15 yards. Previously, if the returner caught it in the air, it was 15 yards. If they caught it off a of bounce, it was only five. Doesn't matter. It's all 15 yards. I think this is strategic. There are a lot of special teams guys like Mark Killam in Calgary. I think maybe even Mike O'Shea in Winnipeg. They are going to be coaching those those returners to maybe I don't know play possum in regards to you know are they gonna are they gonna pick it up are they gonna pick it up now okay now now and then just draw those guys those special teams guys within that five yard hail I think that is I think this is the biggest one and I think this this is the one that's going to have a bigger impact this year in my opinion your thoughts. Uh, I like it. it. It definitely is going to add a lot of, like you said, is a little add an element of gamesmanship. Is that the right term for it? And uh, I think we'll call I've it always liked, yeah, I've always liked the no yards rule opposed to, or I've always liked the, um, yeah, no yards to fair catch. I just thought for the safeties of the players, it was better. And I mean, I'm not going to say that all of a sudden this is going to make returning game a heck of a lot safer because of it, but like you said, it, it might teams might be using it as an advantage somehow. If co coaches are always looking at ways of making things go in their favor, and I'm not really sure how specifically they would do it, but I mean, it'll be interesting to see how it affects the game. Uh, another one that got that uh, garnered some uh, some people talking was. 
Two quarterbacks will now be allowed on the field at the same time, provided all other racial rules are satisfied, which will allow for additional imaginative play calling. This one, I believe, is a good rule change. I don't think you'll actually see much plays that will that will involve two quarterbacks on the, on the same field. And the reason being, and I, and, I, and I say this without any professional football knowledge, but I remember playing bantam football growing up when you saw a quarterback lined up at a different like an actual quarterback now let's let's take the the, the additional quarterback off you know uh, off the off the uh off the banter here when i saw that the original quarterback was lined up somewhere else you knew something was up and then you could you could uh do the audible on the on the defensive side the, you know that when they line up a second quarterback a, you're taking off another weapon that you have that would avoid any possible progression. B, you're also telling the defense, hey, we got something cooked up here, maybe a flea flicker, maybe a, a design play to have the receiver who is now the quarterback to throw it long field. Like you are pretty much telling the defense, hey, we've got something cooking because, you know, let, let's say if you, I mean, that might be the end game to, con, you know, to confuse the defense. Hey, we're going to put on the you know, Ophir BC. Hey, we're going to Michael O'Connor. We're going to line him up on wideout. But we're just going to run the ball up the middle, and and, and that's our end game, right? You might just confuse mm -hmm. them and throw them off guard. But to me, I don't think you'll really see a lot of teams running with this. Uh, your thoughts on this one? Yeah, so the only way to, the way I see it, the only way you're going to get something like that to work successfully is run it repeatedly. You're going to need to see this formation a lot and before you can even think about faking out a defense this isn't like you said piggybacking off what you said this isn't going to be something where you throw this in on a third and five and trick anyone into thinking you know that they're not going to throw use the other quarterback to throw downfield or something like you if you're going to add this as a regular part of your offensive repertoire you're going to have to throw it in a lot without using it or faking it before you can – like the, you're playing the long game on this one if you want to start fooling teams and catching them off guard with that second quarterback down there. If you pull it off, it's going to look amazing. It's going to be fun, but it's going to be a long time to set this up if you think you're going to catch defenses napping on it. Yeah, I think it's something that's going to be cool to allow – but overall, I I think you would be able to count on one hand how many how many times that you know a play with two quarterbacks are going to be run uh, throughout this season. Uh, next change is to also to keep a game moving. A penalty that occurs at the end of the first or third quarter will be assigned, and my uh, yeah will be assigned at the start of the next quarter rather than triggering an extension of the quarter. The non-offending team could still insist the penalty be imposed with the quarter if there is a clear advantage, such as wanting to keep the wind behind for a crucial kick. I think this one, when they when they when they surveyed people, what would you like to see going into the 2022 season? A lot of people said good, you know, even flow to the game, and I think this does it. There's been many times where obviously they could just, you know, you know, certain penalties can be applied on the next quarter. But the old saying is that, well, you can't end the quarter on the penalty. Now this this takes that, that equation out. So I think this is excellent. And this is not going to be talked about enough. Your thoughts? No, and I, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Even when you read the rules, how it would be used in, the, in a team's favor, I really don't think there's much more to elaborate. I think that explains just right there how beneficial that is going to be, at least producing – more offense, uh, more strategy, and just a nice addition, like he's, like the rule basically spells out for you. Uh, there's two more rules. The introduction of a new objectional conduct penalty for quarterbacks who fake giving themselves up Ooh. by pretending to initiate a slide. You talked about this. I can't remember we, what what show this was, but the I tried to like I swear I've seen this in the CFL, but the more the the majority of highlights that came up was the one that you referred. I think it was a college football game. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a good rule. This isn't is that a, interesting. We we talked about that that as soon as that happened. We brought that up on the show, and it was like, 
you're going to see changes. So we called that one. Mm-hmm. Uh, last rule, and this one is kind of okay. This ta- you know, this takes away you know, attempt to take away the chippiness. You know, and we saw this in in games involving Saskatchewan and Hamilton, Saskatchewan and Winnipeg at the Banjo Bowl. Automatic ejection of any player guilty of two unnecessary roughness penalties or two objectionable conduct penalties or a combination of two you are or unnecessary roughness penalties and offensive uh, sorry objectionable conduct penalties for infractions that incur following a play. This will discourage the type of conduct that can threaten a player's safety and disrupt game flow. Uh, this is just a safety measure in my opinion. Um, you know, this is you know what I, I what I want to to make sure that okay unnecessary roughness seems to be uh, okay you can't I don't think you'll actually find a bad unnecessary roughness uh, call objectionable conduct that's going to be an issue. Last year, the one thing that came up, Brandon Banks, the first game Hamilton and Winnipeg, Brandon Banks. Uh, he, I can't remember if he made the first down or whatnot. Brandon Banks got up, tossed the ball to the official, but because a Winnipeg Blue Bomber walked in the way, it hit him in the head, and he got flagged for objectionable conduct. This is something that we need to take care of. The, you know, this is something that we need. If you're going to actually be serious on this, hey, we you had an objectionable conduct penalty. That second call better be legit. Or maybe that second objectionable conduct better because you're going to run your you're going to be under the microscope if this is the type of standard for objectionable conduct like that that there better be a little bit more emphasis on how that rule gets uh, that penalized. Uh, your thoughts before we move on? Yeah, no, I, I I'm going to let you I'm going to leave it at that at what you said too because uh, because I, I think because I'm right yeah <laughs> because you're yeah you're basically right. There's no use for me to pile on there. All right. Uh, earlier on, we talked to, or at least I talked to, the play-by-play guy for the BC Lions, Bob Marjanovic, uh, who has graciously stayed up late. And when I say stayed up late, uh, he was, it was, it, the sun was still out in BC. Uh, he came out and we uh, had a nice little chat about the BC Lions going into a 2022 season. Here it is. The BC Lions evidently now have two in, in Michael O'Connor and Nathan Rourke. Uh are there expectations that many made me seem as unreasonable with, with that? Or, I mean, is there just going to be like just, you know, a regular quarterback that hasn't had that much experience in the CFL? I think the latter. And I think the thing with, with Nathan Rourke, if you've been around this kid, he's he's really wired to you, – you get a good feeling being around him, right? I mean, we talked to him last year, Julio Caravetta and I, and I walked up to him one day at practice. So what's been – the biggest adjustment in terms of being a pro. He says, not playing. Wasn't about the speed of the game or, you know, the the tempo or playing Canadian versus, you know, coming out of the American college game. He just said, I'm not playing. Right? I mean, this kid has a lot of confidence. Um, He's got a high football IQ and he's got a cannon for an arm. Plus, he's mobile. So, I mean, he's got some great qualities. I mean, the biggest thing right now is just experience and how does he handle the pressure of being the number one? How short is the leash? Because he's got experience, but not necessarily starter experience. How far down the road in the in the season do you expect uh, you know the coaches to maybe you know that that leash to shorten uh, as the season progresses? Well, I think it, would, you know, it depends on what Michael O'Connor shows in, in preseason and in training camp. Right? Remember that Rourke knows the system; O'Connor doesn't. Um, but they're going to have to get Michael O'Connor up to speed pretty quick. I, I really believe that this team, the, the management of this team, and the coaching staff believes that Nathan Rourke is going to get this done for him. And, and I say that because if there was doubt, why not go out and get a veteran quarterback to back up Nathan Rourke? Instead, they went out and got a Canadian and Michael O'Connor. Who knows what Michael O'Connor is going to sh- show in training camp and in the preseason? But I, I just think they – the leash is going to be long with Nathan Work. He's really going to have to screw things up pretty bad <laughs> to see Michael O'Connor get in there. And I think the other thing, too, is I don't even think Michael O'Connor is going to be the second option for the team right now. I think that if things really do go sideways for Nathan Work, I think they will probably wind up bringing a veteran quarterback. 
Uh, just step off uh, off the field here because last week we talked about the Edmonton Elks and the breath of fresh air that their new CEO was brought in with Victor Kui. Last year, the BC Lions uh, were under new ownership. Uh, talk talk about your experience and what do you expect with uh, so far? I mean, we we kind of saw how the new ownership in Amar Domain uh, has, has brought in, but what what are you are you expecting? Like, what's the next step under this new ownership going into twenty twenty two? Well, you know, it's interesting because a lot of people have asked about the new ownership. I haven't really seen anything yet that, you know, that signifies a dramatic change in terms of what the ownership um, approach is towards marketing the team. But, you know, we've been told there are a lot of things in the works. And, you know, Mark Doman came out and said that you don't want to miss opening night. It's going to be one of the events of the year. So I don't know what they have planned up their sli- uh planned up their sleeve, but I mean, it, it sounds interesting. I'll, I'll say one thing being around Mr. Doman, and, and that's the fact that he's a visionary. He has a vision in terms of what he wants to do with this team, how he wants to market it, how he wants to brand it, how he wants to sell it. He made a great point. He said, Hey, he goes, I've got three kids. He says, they're all in, in the NFL. None of them wears a lion's Jersey. He says they're all like all NFL fans. And he says, we've got to get to those kids, to that younger generation, and turn them on to the CFL. So I think that's his major goal. And one of the things that you're seeing with the Lions this offseason, especially on social media, is a lot of visits to elementary schools, to high schools, just during the course of the offseason, going around the province and, you know, promoting the brand. So I think that's something that they focused on, and hopefully they're going to see um, some of the fruits of their labor. Uh, speaking of youth, uh, the, the CFL draft is coming up soon in a matter of days. Uh, the BC Lions have the third overall spot. Any talk of who the Lions will take or, or if there are talks of trading up? Because the Lions have been linked to the Philpot Twins. And I even saw something online. I, I don't know if it was earlier today or the other day, but there might be a like a Sedin type deal where they'll trade up to number two or number three and then, or number three and number four to take the Philpot Twins. Are, uh, have you heard any of what the BC Lions may do with that third overall pick? Well, I think one of the Philpot Twins will get chosen by the Lions at that point. Now, are they going to get the other one? That's, that's the question. Um, I, I talked to somebody around the league, and I haven't made too many phone calls in this, but I just had a casual conversation with someone today in a management position, and they said they doubt very much that the Lions will be able to swing a deal to get both Philpots. So um, that probably means that whoever has that other pick, you know, they're probably targeting. I don't know who that would be. I think Edmonton's going to go in on the the linebacker from Syracuse. So, you know, maybe we'll see what happens at two. The Lions are three, see what happens at four or five. But um, I don't think they're going to be able to get both, but, I think that's something that the Lions are going to do their due diligence on. I think Neil McAvoy and Rick Campbell will do their due diligence on that and attempt to get both Phil Potts, but I think it's going to be a tough task. Um, speaking of uh, upper management, the the Lions lost uh, G. Roy Simon to the Elks. Uh, how much will the Lions front uh, front office miss uh, miss the, the the hole? I guess, I don't know if it's a gaping hole, but how much will they miss uh, the presence of I guess uh, all time line great G. Roy Simon? You know that it's 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 an interesting question, and there's a part of me says that they're really not going to miss Giroy that much, and that's not a knock on Giroy. That's just a knock on the structure that they had within the team, and that was that Neil McAvoy was the assistant GM, and um, Rick Campbell, of course, was the assistant. Or pardon me, they're co GMs, not assistant GM, but co GMs, and Giroy really didn't have that much influence at all when Ed Hervey was here. He had a little bit more um, when Rick Campbell and Neil McAvoy took over the, the general manager duties. And, and I think G. Roy's vo- voice was heard, but I still think ultimately the, the call was between Campbell and McAvoy and a lot of the personnel decisions. I think G. Roy has much more of a voice in Edmonton. And just talking to G. Roy about working with Chris Jones and being part of the Elks uh, management team. Uh, I think he's got way more influence, way more of an impact on what's going on in Edmonton this year. And again, that was not, it, it's not a knock on Giro. It's just, you know, a knock on how they structured the system. 
you, you mentioned Brian Burnham, who I think is probably as many numbers as he puts up. I still think that Brian Burnham is still one of the most underrated receivers in the CFL, and that's that's saying a lot. They brought in Lucky Whitehead through free agency last year, and aside from his injury, he was putting up MVP type numbers. Are the Lions satisfied with their receivers, the receiver depth behind those two? Because there were talks that they were going hard on Kenny Lawler, but ended up losing out uh, to him to 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 the Edmonton Elks. So, is there kind of a little bit of uh, you know question marks uh, as far as the depth percent? Uh, depth uh, position behind uh, Whitehead and Burnham? Well, I think, you know, anytime a player like Kenny Lawler is uh, available, you have to go out there and, you know, see if if you can sign him um, because he is a quality receiver. And the, it's funny you mentioned G. Roy Simon. G. Roy Simon actually had got Kenny Lawler into the Lions camp a couple of years ago. And this is when Ed Hervey was the GM. And I guess what had happened was that Lawler had gotten hurt. And I remember Lawler telling me this at the Grey Cup. He got hurt. And then there was um, a bit of an issue in terms of his rehabilitation and who was going to take responsibility for it, how they were going to go about it. And the Lions, I guess, just kind of said, well, you're kind of on your own. He was expecting the Lions to have a little bit more of a, an impact in it in terms of either the treatment and or the, the financial um, reimbursement. For compensation off it, and that kind of left a sour taste in Kelly Law, uh, in Kenny Lawler's mouth, and he wound up, you know, eventually signing with Winnipeg. And Giroy Scheidman had really, really liked him and wanted to get him into camp and got him into camp, and he got hurt. And of course, as we say, the rest is history. But now, of course, it kind of reunited. So, you know, I could see the Lions going after Lawler. He's an impact guy, but in terms of the receivers, I think you know they've got two quality receivers. I mean, they got the guy like Whitehead who can take everything vertical, open things up for underneath for Burnham. Burnham's a receiver who's not going to get you much separation, but man, he doesn't need much. I mean, you give him like three feet and he can, you put the ball in the right place. We've seen him win so many contested battles. But, you know, I think a guy like Keon Hatcher could step up this year. I think another player who could step up for him is, <laughs> excuse me, Dominic Rimes. I think he's another player who could step up. And Javon Katoy is really interesting. I mean, this kid has it all. He has size. He has speed. Uh, I think, you know, once he learns the nuances, and I think he's getting better every year in terms of, you know, recognizing defensive coverage, um, working on his on his um, patterns, uh, I mean, his routes, I should say. Uh, I think that Javon Katoy is a guy who could really explode out of the gates and have a big season for him. So, and, you know, a wild card out of this as well is, DeAnthony Thomas, who had some pretty good years in the National Football League um, with the Kansas City Chiefs and University of Oregon product who the Lions have signed. So we'll see if he's a bit of a wild card in training camp or what he brings. Yeah, another piece of the offense that I think has given Lions fans headaches over the last couple of years is the offensive line. Um, their issue is, you know, being able to keep you know, their, their, their quarterback upright for, for long periods of time. Now, that might have actually pushed Mike Riley into retirement sooner rather than later. Do they have the pieces to be able to help the young guys like Nathan Work or O'Connor um, be successful in the 2022 season? Well, that's the million-dollar question. I think that's probably the biggest concern with this team and, Maybe that's one, and then you might have 1A, which I'll get to in a second. But um, I think probably the biggest concern is the offensive line. You know, there's talk that they're probably going to try to go with three Americans on the offensive line. We'll see how that impacts the O-line. I mean, Kent Perkins, I think, played rather well last year when he came in and played tackle for Riker Matthews. And Matthews, of course, you know, played one or two games, had the concussion issue, and he was done for the year. Um, Joel Figueroa is getting up there, but I mean, this is a guy that, you know, he'll give you everything that he's got. Um, you, this is a guy that you want in a foxhole with you. Soup Chung is, it, it, I think Soup Chung is a, a very good offensive lineman in, in, in a certain system. I mean, Soup Chung is great. He wants to play you in a phone booth. You know what I mean? He, and that's why I think he was so successful in Winnipeg because they ran the ball so much and, you know, kind of really played to, uh, to Soup Chung's strengths. I, I just think that, you know, if you're throwing the ball as much as the Lions did the last couple of years, you, you're kind of taking away from Souk 
Chung's strength. His strength is, you know, playing in that phone booth, you know, grinding it out, um, being, you know, going downhill on run blocking situations. So we'll see what, you know, how, how this year pans out. And uh, I think what they got to do is they re- I think the biggest concern is, is center. And Peter Godber had a really, really tough year last year at center. And, you know, people were, I mean, you could tell the teams were scheming on him, scheming against him, trying to get one-on-one matchups. I mean, uh, I hate to say it and pick on the kid, but, man, I, I can't remember seeing a center get called for that many holding penalties as Peter Godber did. That's pretty tough to do. If you're a center, trust me, there's like guards around you. You've got like 1,400 pounds of beef within six uh, a six foot circumference, and you're getting called for flags for holding. Um, it's not a good sign. The the really, you know, the the wild card I think for the lines on the offensive line again is a guy like David Neville. Here's a guy who's 27. He's been in the league a few years now. Um, he's got size. He's played well when he's got in there. For whatever reason, it, it just hasn't seemed to click. I would love to see the Lions just give him a start. Well, I shouldn't say give him a starting job. I'd like to see David Neville earn a starting job, and the Lions just give him a really long rope to see what he can do because he's a guy that I just think, you know, University of Nebraska kid, he's got a nice pedigree. Um, he's a guy that I think can play, but he needs an opportunity. Where he has to earn that opportunity. Yeah. Uh, speaking of, uh, you know, where we're talking about going hard in free agencies, the Lions went hard upgrading their defense in 2022. You know, guys like Delvin Bro, Lucius Purifoy. And then Steven Richardson, however, a couple of weeks ago, he had an offseason uh, workout, which uh, now he might miss a huge, a uh, huge amount of time. Uh, we'll be lucky. Hopefully, the BC Lions will be in a good position for playoffs when it comes back. Uh, how much will they miss Steven Richardson on that defensive line? Because, you know, they, they, they have Woody Barron, David Menard. Steven Richardson, I, th- I still think, is like one of the most underrated defensive linemen. Again, he came over from Winnipeg, had high hopes to clog up the run, and they won't have him for, for a good chunk of the season. Is that, is, is that a gaping hole, or do the BC Lions, do they have maybe a plan B behind Richardson? Well, I mean, your plan B behind Richardson is Josh Banks, who they had there last year. Um, but he's no Stove Richardson, right? I mean, to me, that when I heard that he was basically done for the year, I'm hearing it's an Achilles. Um, when I heard that, you know, that had occurred, it, I was just like, it was crushing. Because of all the signings that they had, I was the most excited about Richardson. And I think of all the signings that they had, probably the most – um, non-replaceable or irreplaceable signing was Richardson. I mean, what he did, you're right. I mean, to me, one of the more most more underrated players in the league. I mean, this is a guy who can play the one technique, take on double teams, allow your linebackers to roam freely. Um, he's a, a guy who can push the pocket back. And, and you know, I, 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 I always talk about this, and, you know, this is my old defensive line coach coming out from my days at UBC, um, but, I mean, you've got guys off the edge on any team that can get there. I mean, anybody can just, like, get off the edge. But what makes those edge rushers successful is when you have the pocket being pushed back by your interior linemen, the guys playing the one and three techniques, those guys pushing the pocket back. Because now what happens, that quarterback, usually if that pocket's not being pushed back, that quarterback can step up underneath that edge rusher and find a seam and take off or gain more time to throw the football. But if that pocket is being pushed back, it's like a net that now surrounds the quarterback. He's got nowhere to step up. Now he kind of does a little pirouette 360. He's trying to do something. (laughs) And the next thing you know, you wind up sacking the quarterback. So losing Richardson to me was a huge, huge goal because it wasn't just about what still Richardson brought to the table. It's how much better he makes everybody else on that D-line. And look at Winnipeg with Jefferson and Conbo, right? I mean, Jake Thomas, all those guys were better because Stove Richardson was there. And not to downplay their accomplishments, but, man, um, that's a huge – he was a huge, huge part of that Winnipeg defense. And it would have been nice to see what he could do in BC. Yeah, that uh, he missed the first uh, few games in 2021. The Winnipeg Blue Bombers, which put up record numbers, 
they weren't that good against the run. Steven Richardson comes in, and they improved dramatically. Like, that's how good he was. Uh, Bob, last question before we go, and as we do with every one of our guests prior in our preseason, our nine teams in nine weeks, predict the BC Lions record going into the 2022 season. Oh, 18 games this year, right? Yeah. <laughs> I would probably go... I'm going to go, I'm just going to say 9-9 nine and nine <laughs> okay, with that's, that's a swing a of bet. two games. Okay. So as... as, yeah, as nine and 9-9, and they could, they could be 11-7, and seven, they could be 7-11. Oh. and 11. And that was Bob Marjanovic, a uh, play-by-play guy for the BC Lions. Uh, that was a fun interview. And uh, as always, the full interview uh, will be on our YouTube page. Uh, well, I, I, I guess if you're listening to this, you probably already listened to the full interview. Uh, so enough about that. But the full interview will be on our uh, YouTube page. Uh, the Rouge Radio Podcast is sponsored by Manscaped. Manscaped.com. Get 20% off and free shipping free worldwide shipping with the code rouge at manscaped.com that's 20 percent off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use the code rouge unlock your confidence and always use the right tools for the job with manscaped tony i cannot wait we're going into the bc lions this week and i cannot wait because i know what you predicted and you you said a couple of weeks ago maybe a couple of months ago i said something about the Ottawa Red Blacks, uh, I I I, I don't want to issue spoilers because mm-hmm. uh, you know I said hey maybe temper your expectations and you're like hey Dalt hates the Red Blacks and all their <laughs> fans. You're gonna have a lot of heat, my my man. I, I guarantee it. Uh, are you ready to talk uh, the BC the BC lines? I am. All right, let's, I am. let's do this. Oh, wait, are, are you sure? Because Let's right. begin. <laughs> and there's not much to talk about, so this should be a pretty simple show. That's why when you started the show by saying this is going to be exciting, I'm like, wait, I thought we were talking about the BC Lions this week. So, <laughs> All right. The BC Lions in 2021 ended the season five wins and nine losses. 312 points scored four, but 351 points again. Two and five at home. And obviously, you could do the math with what they did on the road, including getting shellacked in Winnipeg, 45 to nothing. Free agents in, Woody Barron, David Menard, Daniel Peterman, Stephen Richardson, Lucius Purifoy, Delvin Bro, Michael O'Connor, and Sean White. Out, Shaq Johnson, Hunter Stewart, and J.R. Tavai. Tony, I, I, I gave away the spoilers. What your thoughts? What's your prediction with the BC Lions? I just think they're a horrible football team. Oh, jeez. Like, okay. <laughs> like, I just, I, I really appreciate how the new owner is trying to hype up the love of football, and and that's great. I hope he gets there. I, the, the, the dream for everyone, no one wants to see a bad team in the Canadian Football League. I mean, there's teams you don't like and you hope they lose, but you don't want to see a team not be successful. And I mean, I, I hope <laughs> I hope the new owner there is able to drive up a love of football in Vancouver again and maybe have it spread all over the province of BC. But I just don't see a good football team there. Like they were they were a bad football team when they had Mike O'Reilly. Now they're a bad football team with no quarterback. And we're going to love to cheer for the Canadian quarterback. And I hope he's successful. This is not about me wanting BC to fail. This is just me thinking BC is going to fail. And there's nothing I like about this team, not in any section of their game, not any part of their game. This is probably going to be... This is going to be as bad as, what, the 2005 Hamilton Tiger Cats? Oh, it, the, it, it's, the mid-2000 Tiger Up until they got Kevin Glenn, they were yeah. horrible. But I am putting this, and I, I really don't know. If I went on, I would just be browbeating them, just being absolutely unmerciful. And I've already been unmerciful in, like, the 45 seconds I've been talking about it, but 
this is a bad football team, and it's going to be a bad football team. Where you tell, where you were telling Red Blacks fans to uh, temper what temper their expectations. Yeah, pump the brakes. Yeah, I'm saying have no expectations. <laughs> just do not expect anything. Be just go out there and do your best to stomach 2022 the best you can because. I don't have my entire list for the season. Uh, I left that at home before I left. I just grabbed my standings. And I don't know who I gave the one win to or against for BC, but I only have them winning one football game the entire season. Wow. It's going to be a rando win. It's it, I, I forget I forget who I gave it against, and it's going to be one of those bizarre ones where maybe they upset one of the top three, top four teams. But I think it's just going to be an absolute train wreck in BC. I have them going one and seventeen, and I'm not sure who the last one and seventeen team is. But I always think of that horrible Tie Cats team only because their one win was against the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, which I really enjoyed. <laughs> the, the 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 one and seventeen Tiger Cats were 2003, and while they made the playoffs, I think the the next year or the year after that. Um, the pretty much the the two thousands was just horrible in Tiger Cat Bell, Bill. It, yeah. it was just nasty. But we're enough about the Tiger Cats. Um, I I went through the schedule like I always do, and I I had I had BC in 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 a higher higher uh, a win total, but with the loss of Stephen Richardson, which you'll 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 you'll, you'll catch up with the interview with Bob, is that now it, it turns out. The majority of the season is likely he's done for the year. Right? With uh, it's an Achilles injury that he's done for the year. Don't expect to see him at all. Um, I had high expectations for BC, and I don't. I'm not one to buy into the Canadian. Like I'd love to see a Canadian quarterback succeed in the CFL, but let's be honest, it hasn't happened, and I can't imagine Nathan Ork or Michael O'Connor being the first one to be making that leap like they're they're good they're good enough to be there on their own merits whether or not they're canadian or not i just like i i I went through their stats and before that they signed isaac harker as the third guy the stats it was just was not pretty combined i think they had four touchdowns and five interceptions and just under a thousand yards throwing that's not good to have in two guys like combined and we talked about offensive line issues in BC. Um, you know, they're okay. So maybe they 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 can you know if they improved on on pass blocking. Maybe Rourke is going to be a little bit more mobile than Michael Riley. Maybe he's going to have that expect that, that that expectation will be met. But you have to be have somewhat of a successful run game, and they don't do it. They don't like. Jamal Lyles, uh, James Butler, not exactly household names to to be running the ball, and they don't have a running game to begin with. Like that, like they hardly run the ball. You know, you've got Suk Chung, which is an excellent run blocker, but they don't run. You're asking him to be a man amongst men, and they just you know as far as pass blocking, and they he just can't do it. Now defensively, I thought that they did. They did a tremendous work in upgrading that defense on the defensive line. They got, like I mentioned earlier, Menard, Betts, uh, Richardson. Now Richardson is gone. Okay, well, what are they going to do with the the linebacker in secondary? Okay, that's going to be good enough. But if you're if you have an opposing quarterback which has time to make those reads and time to make those throws, that that upgrade in the secondary may not mean that much. And they added Sean White as as a field goal kicker. Okay, so maybe if they get across center field, they can get a couple of field goals. Great. My expectations for BC is I don't think they're they're I'm not going to be hard on them like you were, because when I went through the schedule, I had them at seven and eleven. I think that is a yeah. Wow. It's, a, it's you know two more wins that they had last year, and and in my opinion, based on the roster turnover. That's a vastly improved. However, that was with Steven Richardson. 
And as I said with my interview with Bob, I think he's probably the most underrated player that they got through free agency, and they won't have him. Now they're going to be stuck with Brian Burnham. You know, Nathan Rourke is going to have to carry the load a little bit more because that defense is just not going to be sustainable. You know, hey, they they might just, you know, start off right out, out of the gate having this, like, uh, this staunchy defense. I just don't see it under Rick Campbell. He's never had that kind of staunchy defense. Uh, and, and, you know, who's the uh, man? Uh, the, the, their new, uh, Ryan Phillips, I think it's the, the defensive coordinator. Um, he's got a lot to work with. So that 7-11 and record that I had, had predicted is now just a, that's the bar that I have him. Anything more than that is is great. But the expectation now without that 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 plug on the defensive line, I you know, maybe 5 and 13 is just a little bit more realistic, you know, build off the good young prospects that you have. You know, the draft is coming up. Are you able to to to, to trade up to get both field pot twins? You know, is that going to be accessible? Is whoever you're going to grab a, a number three overall is there going to make set, a, like a sudden impact in 2022? That's going to be something to look at. But I've got as as low as five and thirteen and as high as seven eleven for BC Lions. That's vastly improved over what they had last year. Uh, I think it's good enough for fifth. And unfortunately for BC Lions fans, uh, it's going to be the third straight season uh, without uh, without making the playoffs. Now, I didn't go on and say that I absolutely hate the BC Lions and they're a terrible football team, like Mr. Tony Allen there with you. But uh, but not uh, not exactly high praise. So, uh, Tony, where where can we find you on on Twitter where our fans could be like, you know? Berate you. <laughs> I don't know. What do I even do anymore? Uh, uh, Tony Rouge? Is that my Twitter handle? I don't even know anymore. I don't even know anymore. All right. Uh, well, that'll wrap, that'll wrap it up uh, for this week's podcast, episode 432. We have got confirmation as we focus on the Montreal Alouettes next week. We welcome Cliffy D, one of the hosts of the Alouette Flight Deck podcast. Looking forward to talking Vernon Adams and his personal hatred for one Trevor Harris. Oh, I am. Oh, you you thought Tony does not does not like Trevor Harris? Cliff is uh, he's adamant that Trevor Harris does not belong in the CFL, much less with the Montreal Alouettes. But we will focus on that last next week. This week, we are done. You're listening to the Canadian or the Rouge Radio podcast powered by the Canadian Football Podcast Network. Tony, any final thoughts before we head out? Yes, adults. We are 22 days away from the first CFL preseason game. There is football this month. Yeah, I can't wait. Yeah. You know, maybe for uh, Mother's Day. <laughs> take 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 Tracy to a preseason game if there's uh, if there's some time. I like it. We uh, I mean we live about ten minute walk away from the Bomber Stadium, so I I'm uh, I'm looking forward to uh, going there like tailgating outside, just just parking my uh, my lawn chair on the driveway and just kind of listening to the to the 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 IG Field Cannibal. By the way, the the Winnipeg Blue Bombers came out with their third jersey. Your thoughts on that one? Did, Did they? You? Yeah. Oh, I yeah, guess you didn't I, see them. <laughs> no, I had no idea. This was not even something that I remember. How did, how did this not even get around Twitter? I feel like I shouldn't have missed twits, tweets, tweets, tweets. Well, it, it's it's funny because the, these are third jerseys, so the Bombers will only wear them twice this year. So twice out of six, uh, 18 games. 99% of Bomber fans love them. Three percent of non-bomber fans love them, so there's ninety-seven percent that just absolutely hated them. And I gotta say, I, I'm not a huge fan of oh, them. Oh, but... I just found it. Yeah, I gotta tell you, oh. like for alternate jerseys, not bad. They're staying with the the mode of blue and gold. Yeah. I'm not a big fan of the giant W on the front, but yeah, I gotta tell you, the these are miles and miles and miles and miles and miles and miles ahead from those god awful jerseys that they came out with in 2014. Remember those uh, gold those... ones? No, with no, 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 w? no. They uh, no, they had uh, the uh, the army, the blue, like they they almost oh, were reminiscent of the Argonauts. Right. Yeah, right. Like though that that I've 
I forgot that they had them until someone brought it up comparing them. It's like, okay, I'm not a big fan of them, but they're better. Like, they are miles ahead of that, but... So, I just assumed they would use the old Winnipeg Jets logo that moved to Phoenix because <laughs> Winnipeg just likes using irrelevant logos to their teams <laughs> anyway, so well, put if, the Thrashers logo on there or something, I don't know. Well, I mean, yeah, you just, know what, you know, we can at least maybe put a Grey Cup logo on it because we know that the Bombers are winning that Grey Cup again. If they go, <laughs> if they, what did you say, if they go like two for two this season, is that the jersey they wear in the Grey Cup to try I, and... I think so because didn't they like didn't they have like a good record with the gold jerseys and and then 2007, Kevin? Because that's what the Stampeders used to do with their Labor Day black jersey. Yeah, is they get to the Grey Cup and they wear the black one because they won every Labor Day wearing it. Yeah, I think I just talked myself out of the Bombers doing that because the last time they did that, Kevin Glenn broke his arm and and then Ryan Dinwiddie. <laughs> uh, Gave away the Grey Cup in 2007. I'm still, I'm still upset about that game. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I had I, I expectations for that game. Anyway, enough about talking about my my depression about Grey Cups gone by. For Tony, I'm Daltz. Thanks for listening, and we'll definitely see you next. Week. Thanks for listening. Find more great shows like this at CF Pod Network on Twitter.